Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Mary Fournier Goldson Lecture. My name is Melissa Begg and I have the great honor and pleasure of being the Dean of the Columbia School of Social Work. The Goldson Lecture gives us an excellent opportunity for our community to come together and expand our knowledge and awareness of latest discoveries, trends, and innovations, such as those that will be shared by our honored guest, Dr. Maria Rodriguez. Established in 1991, the Mary Fonier Goldson Lecture honors the vision and memory of its namesake, a member of the Columbia School of Social Work faculty and a tireless advocate on behalf of children and families. This lecture is intended to keep Professor Fonier Goldson's vision and memory alive and continue her commitment and devotion to the field of child welfare. I'd like to say just a few more words about this beloved member of CSSW's faculty. Um, she was born in Birmingham, Alabama in 1935. She received her BA from Bennett College in North Carolina and her MSW from Case Western Reserve University School of Social Work. In 1969, we were fortunate that she joined CSSW, where she directed programs in child welfare. She was a treasured teacher and colleague until her untimely passing in 1990. Before joining Columbia as an assistant professor, she was director of the Community Consultation Center of Henry Street Settlement, where she was responsible for the supervision of the Comprehensive Community Health Program, and she served on numerous boards and was member of key child welfare organizations, including the Citizens Committee for Children of New York. Professor Goldson was also consultant to the Lower East Side Family Union and to family and children's service agencies in New York, New Jersey, Ohio, and Florida. She was a significant force in shaping integrated and comprehensive services to families and children. Her colleagues have described her as a superior teacher who could light up a classroom with her capacity to engage students. She was a dedicated social work professional and a remarkable person. I'm sorry, sorry I never got to meet her, but I'm grateful to her for the legacy of justice work that she left to our school. Now. I have the great pleasure of introducing tonight's moderator, my amazing colleague and friend, Dr. Desmond Patton. Dr. Patton is Professor of Social Work and Senior Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Curriculum Innovation here at CSSW. He is also the inaugural Associate Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Columbia's Data Science Institute. Dr. Patton's research interrogates pathways to violence, both online and offline, in unique ways. He takes an innovative approach using quantitative and computational, sorry, qualitative and computational data methods to study how and why violence, grief, and identity are expressed on social media and the impact these expressions have on well being among low income youth of color. At our school, Dr. Patton has played leadership roles with a number of exciting initiatives here at CSSW, including Safe Lab, AI for All, and the Action Lab for Social Justice, uh, and far too many others to name. In December, we were delighted to learn that Dr. Patton was invited to serve on the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences Committee on Scientific Freedom and Responsibility, a committee with a long history of focusing on scientific freedom in a global context. Dr. Patton, Desmond, glad to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Melissa. I am so delighted to welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Maria Rodriguez from the University of Buffalo. Dr. Rodriguez research sits at the intersection of applied demography, computational social science, and social policy. The first line of her work examines the ethical implications of algorithmic decision-making in human services, child welfare in particular. The second line of research examines the lived experiences of marginalized communities as self-reported on social media. The through line between the two concerns, the method involved, Dr. Re Dr. Rodriguez's substantive focus is how computational methods can support using large, unstructured text data to scale social work interventions across the micro, meso, macro spectrum. Um, I get to hang out with Dr. Redrick, Dr. Rodriguez at the Harvard Berkman Client Center. We're both faculty associates there, and we both serve on Twitter's academic advisory board. So I am so delighted to welcome you to Columbia Social Work. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully y'all all can hear me. Um, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. Good evening. Uh, what I'll be sharing with you today is um, some work that I am uh, currently doing. It is ongoing work. Um, the title of which is Do the Rules Define the Reality? Linking State Level Child Welfare Policy to Outcomes. And before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and honor the sovereignty of the Six Nations, the Mohawk, the Cayuga, the Onondaga, the Oneida, 
the Seneca and the Tuscarora. I live and work on their land, uh, on the land of the Seneca Nation specifically here in Buffalo, New York. And I offer my thanks to them and their ancestors for the opportunity to do so. I'm also gonna share with you uh, my positionality because it informs what I'm gonna share with you today. So I identify as an Afro-Latina cisgendered heterosexual woman. I also identify as the daughter of two generations of immigrants uh, from the Dominican Republic. My ancestors are the Taino and Arawak people, uh, West African people kidnapped and enslaved um, predominantly from Benin, Togo, and the Congo, who recreated their homes as best they could in the island then known as Haiti, now Hispaniola, as well as the colonizers who made their home in the Dominican Republic, uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese, among others. And I give my thanks to my ancestors for their guidance and protection and ask them to accompany me on this talk today. And so um, here's sort of an overview of um, what I'm really excited to share with you today. Uh, I'm going to uh, take it back a little bit and give us a brief history of child welfare policy in the United States, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, I'll share with you um, some of the problematic assumptions with what where, with where child welfare policy and practice and research, research excuse me, is today. I'll share with you um, some visuals of my team um, who've been working on this project, uh, share some of the aims and questions, and then uh, offer you some of the results that we have uh, currently that we are continuing to work on and um, offer a summary before taking some of your questions, hopefully all of them. And so I'm really hoping that um, those of you who have MSWs um, remember your history of social welfare policy course. Um, but in case you don't, um, you might remember that um, child welfare policy and child poli or social service policy in the United States in general um, began um, in England and Wales um, with the Elizabethan Poor Laws. Um, which were passed in 1597 um, that were in, in, in themselves a reaction to an economic recession. So in the 1700s, when we're thinking about uh, the development of this country, uh, in essence, children who were poor, whose parents couldn't care for them, children who were orphans, were um, given into indentured servitude. And it's important to know that uh, this was actually pretty commonplace at the time. Um, the thinking was that um, for youth who were poor, children who were poor, their uh, parents would be too indulgent with them. Uh, in other words, their parents would love them and would not make them work so hard. And so uh, they should um, be given into the care of someone else to train them in a trade. And the same for orphans, there's no one else in the world. So in order for them to make their way, um, they should be given into someone else's care. But importantly, the, the passage of the, Elizabeth, of the Elizabethan poor laws and their sort of uh, bringing over here to the United States, it gave us three very specific um, uh, types of poor folks. Um, and it's important to note that uh, for the Elizabethan poor laws and certainly for early Americans, poverty was seen as immorality. There was uh, something morally, uh, spiritually wrong with you. And that is why that was the cause of your poverty. And so the alleviation of that required intensive spiritual practice, um, required um, sort of uh, tough love, for lack of a better phrase. Um, then in addition, you know, we have these definitions of poverty. So first and foremost was someone who was classified as a vagrant. Uh, vagrants were people who were seen to be lazy, again, morally lacking, uh, spiritually inferior. Uh, the second category was those who were involuntary, involuntarily unemployed. In the instance of the uh, 1700s, the idea being that um, there was uh, you know, recession and people were losing their jobs. And so it wasn't their fault. We just had to kind of help reroute them. And then, of course, the helpless. And this is the category that children fell in. Um, although they were seen as helpless, they were still subject to the same types of services or resolutions to their poverty. So again, 
uh, the Elizabethan poor laws established two forms of relief, one being indoor, meaning you were taken to a place, uh, the poor house, or the, also known as the workhouse, uh, where you lived and in exchange for your room and board and food, uh, you performed labor. Um, certainly at quite a discount than you would if you were on the free market. And secondly, there was outdoor relief, the idea bit there being sort of in-kind services, money, food and clothing, um, et cetera. In the 1800s, uh, we saw the development of orphanages in the United States as indentured, indentured servitude sort of kind of went by the wayside. And this was pre predominantly created and funded by religious institutions. So again, we see the thread continuing poverty as immorality, poverty as a spiritual deficit. Um, local governments uh, did contribute funds, um, but as the uh, 1800s rolled on, the Industrial Revolution continued. In fact, as social work developed, um, if we remember social work as a profession began as a direct response to the Industrial Revolution, we also saw the development of orphanages and uh, philanthropy uh, that looked to uh, offer funds to orphanages. And we saw sort of the beginnings of private, pri uh, private public collaborations. In addition, we started to see this developing idea of childhood as maybe sacrosanct or at the very least distinct from adulthood. Certainly before this time, children were just seen as tiny adults. Uh, they weren't seen as, um, you know, life course wasn't necessarily something we thought about. Instead, we understood children um, as simply uh, small adults who should be treated in far, uh, by and large the same way as we would treat adults. Uh, the most uh, sort of distinct, uh, the, the beginning uh, cornerstone of child welfare policy, you might recall, are the orphan trains. And uh, the orphan trains were um, a program that uh, went on between 1894 and 1929. And they started in New York City, in fact, uh, started um, at the Children's Aid Society. Uh, which Columbia University has a long history with. Um, the founder of, the, of this particular program or movement um, was uh, Reverend uh, Minister Charles Loring Brace. I uh, was a New York City minister who sort of noticed that there was a problem uh, of children who were homeless and an in, in increasing number of children who were homeless in New York City. And so between uh, this time period, we had approximately a quarter of a million homeless children who were placed in foster homes, uh, but those children were predominantly placed in the Midwest. So they were uh, taken on trains. We see here an image of uh, children lined up outside uh, of a train at a stop where they were in essence being uh, sort of showcased uh, for families who were uh, potentially waiting to take them. Uh, and we see on the right hand side of the screen, um, a wanted ad. Um, uh, the practice was to place ads along the routes of certain trains in the local newspaper and let folks know in those towns that the sort of orphan train was coming and uh, the time and date and, and what kinds of folks were, uh, what kinds of folks they wanted um, as homes for children. Um, it was, it's important to understand that the, the orphan trains coincided with an uh, increased need for labor, uh, particularly agricultural labor in the Midwest. And so um, Brace in particular believed that street children would have better lives if uh, they were able to leave the poverty and quote debauchery of their lives in the city and were raised instead by quote morally upright farm families. Um, and so again, we see the thread continuing of poverty as uh, spiritual deficiency, poverty as immorality. Um, but it, it's important to note that Brace also recognized this, this need for labor. And so he felt that, you know, these children who were homeless could be taken um, to these uh, homes and uh, out in the Midwest, and that they would be loved or at the very least um, wanted um, because of their ability to, provi to provide um, free labor. And so, of course, the orphan trains are the foundation for um, child welfare policy as we know it, um, which was begun um, as part of the Social Security Act in the 1930s. Um, so one of the important things to me about this foundation 
of child welfare policy in the United States is the understanding that it began as a way to literally remove poverty from our site, right? So we took uh, people, in this case, children who didn't have, um, maybe who um, you know, were extra in their family or for whatever reason, their grownups couldn't ha- take care of them. And we, we picked them up um, away from our immediate periphery and literally placed them somewhere else, hundreds of miles away, um, in fact. And so um, I think this is an important uh, thing to remember throughout the, the remainder of this talk. The other uh, sort of origin of uh, child welfare, uh, we can understand, is uh, the Indian, so-called Indian boarding schools. And so this was a, a practice that was begun through policy, um, specifically the Civilization Fund Act of uh, 1819, passed March 3rd, 1819. And uh, this act uh, authorized the President of the United States to quote, in every case where he shall judge improvement in the habits and condition of such Indians practicable to employ capable persons, again, of good character to introduce uh, to any tribes the, quote, art of civilization. And so the image on this slide is actually the um, Indian school at Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And as we may know from uh, some of the news coming out of uh, Canada, um, the, the history of Um, Indian boarding schools was one in which children very specifically were taken from their homes, kidnapped, uh, taken to these places, uh, stripped of their identity, uh, stripped of um, their language, their religion, uh, their culture, and uh, in essence assimilated forcibly into um, American spirituality, uh, American values, uh, social values, economic values, and so on. And so the twin Um, phenomenon, Indian boarding schools, as well as the orphan trains, again, illustrates the centrality of um, the the reproduction of uh, specific American cultural values onto youth, uh, onto children who were seen as, still seen as helpless. So, uh, you know, still understood as as a particular group of people that needed to somehow be protected, but very deliberately Uh, turned into, uh, indoctrinated into a particular uh, way of thinking. And spirituality was uh, perhaps, uh, arguably, um, central to that because the idea was that if you could, again, change the the spirituality, the moral compass, if you will, of a child, then you could prevent them from experiencing poverty. And so... When we think about some of the important policy, child welfare policies of today, uh, some that come to mind um, are sort of thinking about child welfare as it has developed from this origin of you know, poverty as immorality, children as uh, needing to be saved from um, uh, immorality uh, so that they don't become poor. What we see is child welfare beginning in sort of the late 1990s, uh, arguably uh, beginning to sort of try to reconcile some of these earlier histories, uh, some of these earlier missteps and attempting to find ways to um, at the very least pull back um, and on the more ideal side, um, beginning to sort of undo some of this, uh, some of these harms, uh, arguably. Um, And so um, what we see is that child welfare policy today, um, and certainly within the past 30 years, sort of mimics social welfare policy more broadly because of this realization that individuals do better in social settings, do better under the conditions of self-determination, and that um, who people are isn't necessarily tied to their economic station in life. And so some of the key policies that we might think about are the um, adoption and, and um, uh, adoption assistance and child welfare act, um, which um, had this understanding that individuals um, or that mandated that youth be placed in family-like settings. We have the adoption and safe families act, which incentivized adoption, the preventing sex trafficking and strengthening families act of 2014, which Uh, help to ensure that youth have opportunities to participate in case planning. And then the Family First Prevention Services Act, 
uh, which looks to allocate federal funding uh, to evidence-based programs that support family preservation, kinship care, and increasing efforts to keep youth with their families. Now, importantly, uh, perhaps arguably one of the more important, um, if not the most important act um, in recent history is the Foster Care Independence Act. And so this was signed into law in 1999 and established the John H. Chafee Foster Care Program for Successful Transition to Adulthood. In this policy, the federal government allocates Title IV-E funding to states that, uh, in order to provide services to foster youth uh, who are likely to age out of care. And so uh, states use these funds to um, refund, refund foster care agencies, both public and private, uh, for services that are rendered to youth. Uh, the services funded by the Chafee program also include things like mentoring, financial assistance for housing, and post-secondary education. And so having thought about sort of the, this brief overview of child welfare policy writ large, we kind of, we come to some of the, the practice context of today. And one of the key things is um, the advent of predictive analytics. And so what we've seen sort of in the past roughly 10 years is um, as uh, machine learning tools have developed, as AI has developed, uh, we've seen individual uh, uh, groups, uh, states, localities, uh, child welfare jurisdictions taking an increased interest in wanting to automate the decision-making process within child welfare uh, towards various ends, whether it be the argument before increased efficiency, increased efficacy, um, or just simply cost savings. Certainly part of the issue um, with this uh, general endeavor is concretely that there's huge uh, variations um, in the way that states implement child welfare policy. So we've spent some time chronicling the history and, the, and uh, some of the more recent notable policies um, but those are sort of federal thresholds, federal um, minimum points. States, uh, depending on their permissiveness, depending on their um, resources, uh, implement child welfare policy in a great variety of ways. And three key ways that these variations are potentially um, of interest to child welfare scholars, uh, researchers, practitioners, but really uh, across the social science, uh, certainly applied social science spectrum, um, is uh, three particular points of variation. So the first would be funding, um, and specifically funding allocations, um, the ways in which even those chafee dollars that we've uh, mentioned, who gets that money, how it's, imp how it's used, what kinds of programs, um, the, the amount of variation in that is, is quite large, um, but we don't have any research necessarily on um, you know, where the cost savings are, where uh, the most efficacy lies. In other words, uh, do, we don't have any evidence around you know, this is some of the best ways to use this money, this is some of the worst ways to use this money. Certainly that work is ongoing, um, and I know of you know, certain folks who are engaged in that. Um, the second point is outcomes. So as since the, the variation in child welfare policy is so broad across states, um, we have although we have national data sets um, that sort of collate child welfare outcomes both for youth actively in care, uh, act youth who are uh, whose care is unsubstantiated, but maybe they go into prevention, or um, youth who age out we don't have any causal mechanisms to identify, okay, these are some of the, these jurisdictions are, have been really useful or have been really effective in the way that they deliver their child welfare policy, whether it be prevention or, um, you know, group, uh, group homes, etc. cetera. Um, and we also don't know anything about what uh, doesn't work <laughs> necessarily. Right, um, and so folks who are in the child welfare field will tell you, you know, um, it's it's like finding a needle in a haystack, right? Um, and then the last thing um, that is really um, a key issue for folks who are interested in child welfare is just the on the ground conditions. So, uh, with varying states come various social, economic, political conditions that again make certain policies uh, effective passable, permissible, and others not. And so uh, 
my team and I have been thinking about this for several years, and we, we started to sort of detail in plain terms what we understood to be some of the key problematic assumptions um, in uh, child welfare policy in general, uh, child welfare practice in particular, particular in the context of predictive analytics and AI. And the first is the fundamental assumption that the future will look like the past. In fact, I might edit this to say that the future necessarily must be the past. Predictive analytics broadly defined, regardless of the algorithm used or the impetus um, to implement, um, codifies, it codifies the past into the future. So in, in other words, whatever data we are putting into an algorithm, that is the same kind of data that we will get out. Whatever we have done in the past is what we're encoding into the future. And so for those of us who are invested in reform, um, or um, at the very least, perhaps we're uh, more idealistic in um, our desires for child welfare, in particular human services in general, this assumption, uh, the, the idea that if we take, if we have enough data about the past, we'll be able to predict our future, negates anything that we are doing in the present. The second problematic assumption is that what works for most is good enough. And so this um, utilitarian idea pervades uh, social service policy in the United States, in my opinion. Um, but certainly child welfare, the idea that, well, if, you know, if enough kids are doing well, then, you know, there's really not a whole lot we need to do to change anything. Um, we, you know, these, whoever this program isn't working for just needs to try harder. Um, it harkens back to that idea of uh, immorality, um, spiritual deficiency as the cause of your discontent, right? And so uh, the idea that, um, if child welfare policy sort of broadly construed, if whatever specific program um, isn't working for a certain group of um, individuals, youth, then the problem is individual in nature is a very problematic assumption in our opinion. Thirdly is this, uh, specifically speaking to the use of predictive analytics and AI in general in child welfare, and this is that cost effectiveness equals efficiency. So again, this, um, the idea that if we if we can find a way to spend less money on people who need help, uh, then we can be more confident that what we are doing is effective and efficient. Um, we'll be able to churn people out quickly. Of course, this is an issue that pervades social services in general if from the start of, you know, hearkening back to, you know, the 50 minute hour, right, for billing purposes for um, practitioners. Um, trying to cram more into less amount of time um, is a problematic assumption because it, it does not invest in the present, right? It does not invest in um, who people could be if we um, offered them uh, more resources today. The fourth assumption, um, is maybe what really grinds my gears, um, <laughs> um, at least when it comes to predictive analytics um, and AI. And, this, and it's this assumption that automation somehow clarifies accountability, right? So we hear, we, you may be familiar with some of the arguments around predictive analytics and child welfare. And part of that is, well, you know, if we have this algorithm, um, we have these, you know, codified rules, then we'll be able to say for sure, you know, oh, well, this is the reason that, um, you know, this uh, particular case was uh, substantiated or not. And the reality is that automation clarifies nothing except, um, you know, math, I guess. I don't really know what automation <laughs> clarifies other than we've agreed to continue along the same path that we have always been, right? So what might be clarified are our um, actual values. And so if what, uh, what we value is, again, um, if what we value is human, humanity, uh, humans um, becoming the best versions of themselves, despite any challenges that they might face externally or even internally, automation uh, doesn't clarify the pathways to that um, or even uh, the, um, the need for that necessarily. 
uh, one of the, the fifth problematic assumption, arguably in, in, in our minds, is that human services are measurable, right? And so what we uh, see a lot in, at least what I've seen a lot in child welfare recently is the uh, you know, uh, data use agreements between jurisdictions, between um, uh, various agencies within a locality. So for example, there might be a data sharing agreement between a police department and a child welfare uh, jurisdiction, uh, family court uh, and schools. And so the idea here is that, well, you know, this, these data points give us um, a clear indication of a, of a particular person's pathway or of um, the, you know, problematic or problems that uh, might be happening within a particular community. And the reality is, um, at least, you know, those of us who are within the social work profession know uh, that human services are relational. Right, people who are going uh, under uh, MSW training, BSW training, PhD training, uh, hopefully, are taught that uh, the relationship, right, the the th whether it be a therapeutic relationship and or uh, organizational relationship, uh, a community based relationship, it is the relationship that carries forward um, whatever the work is that is in front of uh, that those groups, whatever the problems are, whatever the um, uh, deltas might be, whatever the things that need to be changed might be, it is the relationships uh, that carry those things forward. And relationships aren't necessarily measurable. They are not certainly completely quantifiable. Lastly, um, and this is more of an assumption, I think, on the part of folks who are more into the sort of data science or computer science area, is uh, this assumption that child welfare looks the same everywhere. Right. Um, and so, again, those of us who are in child welfare generally or human services more broadly are very aware that you know, policies differ by states, differ by cities. The way that you can implement um, prevention services in child welfare in New York is vastly different than the way that you can implement them in Kansas, for example. Um, part of that has to do with politics, sure, but other, it also has to do with, with resources, with the history of those agencies. So the context um, is central to any work that we do in human services broadly or child welfare very specifically. Um, and in fact, when I speak to my, uh, when I first started speaking to my colleagues uh, um, in computer science, uh, certainly um, here at UB, um, you know, <laughs> they, we did a lot of like uh, going through early policy so that folks could understand that what a lot of what we're doing, um, arguably all of what we're doing when we're using predictive analytics and child welfare is using data that is meant to surveil people and asking that data to help us free them. Right? And so understanding that paradox is key uh, to any kind of um, machine learning based or AI based work that might be happening within child welfare. And so here's uh, some of the folks on the team. Um, and so what, I'm, what I'll be uh, sharing with you today is uh, some work uh, that uh, this team is doing. Uh, this is part of a larger NSF funded project, the title of which is uh, FAI, Building a Fair Recommender System for Foster Care Services Within the Constraints of a Socio-Technical System. Um, and so a subset of us there, you know, we're, these folks are spanned from, you know, uh, associate faculty down to undergraduates. And um, as we've been examining uh, the NDA CAN uh, data set, uh, National Youth and Transition data, we've started to ask questions about policy. And so um, that's what I'll be presenting to you uh, today. So specifically, our aim uh, in this, uh, the policy portion of this work is to clarify, to clearly illustrate the relationship between child welfare policy and child welfare outcomes. And so our question is, to what extent do the administrative rules predict child welfare outcomes for youth in foster care? Um, and so right now we're in the process of uh, finishing up our work around youth who are actively involved in foster care. Um, and we'll be moving on next to talking about youth who are aging out. Some folks might be thinking, well, why policy and outcomes? I hope not many of you are thinking that, but just in case you are, um, the pol policies are the rules of the game, right? Their policy is the, are the rules of engagement, um, whether they be at the federal level, the state level, or the local level, um, policies dictate the, the, the boundaries, the parameters under which we can operate, the constraints that we are all under. 
And often more times than not, they also um, dictate um, how far we can go, right? How far we can go, how free can we actually be? And um, so to our way of thinking, if you learn the rules, you can figure out how to break them, right? And so some of us might be aware of some of the conversations happening around uh, critical social work, certainly abolitionist social work, um, and to the extent that we might be curious about what the system is actually engaged in and how that system uh, constrains us and oppresses us, binds us, uh, I would submit that policy is the way that we would begin to understand that. And so what we've done is um, we have gathered um, uh, data on, um, uh, we have gathered all the policy <laughs> uh, that we could find uh, using the Child Welfare Information Gateway State Statutes uh, Search Database. Um, we use that as a guide to identify the relevant state statutes and regulations. Um, this is an electronic resource for those of you who might not be familiar that operates under the auspices of the U.S. Children's Bureau. Um, and it provides, it's publicly available and it provides access to information about child welfare policy, practice, and statistics. And so we entered um, a few search terms um, into uh, CWIG's database to generate just a summary of, given, of, of a, any given state's policies and regulations regarding child abuse and neglect uh, and the child welfare system. And we specifically excluded adoption um, this time around. Um, and so uh, following that, we gathered everything we could, which uh, this graphic illustrates. So. Uh, just a little uh, under, uh, so 23,298 policy documents have been gathered. Excluding adoption, we think that this is, you know, maybe about 85 to 90% complete. Uh, we're in the process of double checking some of those lower counts. Um, what you see here on the left is um, administrative statutes, uh, the number of documents pertaining to administrative statutes by state. And on the right hand, you see um, were the number of words uh, all of those documents together comprise. It's over 13 million words. And um, this process by itself was particularly enlightening um, because you might think, at least we thought, well, you know, these are laws, so we're all subject to these laws. Uh, we should be able to easily find these laws. And it turns out that is not true. Uh, um, whether it be, you know, states not necessarily having publicly accessible databases, uh, you know, websites that actually lay out statutes. Um, we ended up using case text a lot, which is a, a platform that uh, collates uh, laws across the country. Um, but uh, we're actually working on a paper that discusses this process and very specifically because it's very, at least to our mind, very telling about how central the rules are and how um, important it is to be invested in finding where they are and, and ensuring that they're accessible to the public. Um, for those of us who are familiar with the uh, evolution of uh, human service, social service policy in the United States, taking a look at the administrative statute side of this graph might be particularly interesting or surprising uh, given what we know about state permissiveness of social policies um, for some of the states mentioned. So I know for myself, um, recognizing that Washington and Texas were some of the more numerous um, administrative, is where we found some of the more numerous administrative statutes um, versus somewhere like uh, Massachusetts, which is uh, closer to the bottom. Um, you know, this, this, this process by itself, um, I could spend hours talking about. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll tell you what we did with all this information. So uh, the first phase of this project is quantitative text analysis. Um, in essence, we'll, we um, are in the process of finishing up uh, stru structural topic modeling, excuse me, which um, in essence um, is an unsupervised machine learning algorithm that um, allow, in a, you can liken it to a principal components analysis uh, quantitatively. Uh, it takes documents and um, based on a series of parameters that uh, the researcher dictates, um, clusters, uh, documents, um, 
uh, in terms of topics. And I wrote a paper about this a few years ago where I sort of argue for structural topic modeling as the first round, um, or at least uh, very similar to the first round of qualitative coding. And so what we're using uh, structural topic modeling do, to do specifically in this project is to uh, seed a deductive codebook um, that we'll be using in our second uh, phase, uh, which is the actual qualitative analysis, which we don't think there's any way to get out of, which is to actually sit and read um, every statute um, for every state. And so we'll be starting with New York State, which is um, approximately 493 documents, at least at the current time. Um, the other thing to note is that um, we thought a lot about whether or not it was useful to have an inductive codebook versus a deductive codebook. Um, and to the extent that we wanted to be led um, by a process that could be um, replicated further on, as in the case of structural topic modeling, um, any person could come you know, behind us and replicate what we did, get the same exact topics that we did, assuming that we did it correctly and check for themselves. Um, we thought it was much more important, at least at this time, to go with a more deductive method. And so uh, here's where we're at right now. So uh, this graphic um, uh, illustrates the seven words within a topic that defines that topic. And the entire graphic illustrates the top 20 topics um, in this particular data set. We ran several models and we came to the consensus, consensus that an STM that specifies about 74 topics is about right. Um, and we could talk more in the Q&A about um, uh, parameters for that. Um, but um, we're going to, so these are the, uh, the top 20 most proportional topics. And what we can see is some clear words. So topic 27, which is at the top, um, talks about uh, children, uh, custodians, legal custodians, and responses to uh, legal custodians versus temporary custodians, um, and so forth, and so on. So what I'm gonna do now is dive into a few of these very specific topics. Uh, so this graphic illustrates topic correlations that are estimated by the model. In essence, you can think of it as a network of all the topics uh, that were estimated by the model. And um, uh, the, the size of the number, the number refers to just the topic um, as it was estimated. It, um, and the size of that number indicates uh, the proportion that that specific topic comprises in the total data set. So in other words, if you were to sum up all of these proportions, they would add up to 100, the entire data set. Um, and then the, um, the lines, the thickness of the lines in between um, each point, each topic refers to the correlation, the strength of the correlation between uh, any two topics. And so the arrows point to you to uh, the topics that I'm going to share with you today. Um, and um, I think you'll find them interesting. So here's topic 73. Um, and topic 73 is estimated to specifically refer to the removal of a child from the home. And um, here's a sample excerpt um, from Texas, which says that, um, you know, it's speaking about the um, whether, how um, the, the jurisdiction in Texas um, defines the continuing necessity of um, uh, the, uh, the appropriateness of the placement of a child. Uh, but what caught our attention was this uh, portion on the, uh, the, a child who's been placed outside of the state. And so we know that various state jurisdictions have various ideas or policies around this. Uh, there are federal thresholds in place, certainly, um, where you know, these kinds of things should be avoided and certainly policy is ongoing. But um, at least based on this particular excerpt, we might be curious about um, whether or not, um, whether and how out-of-state placement might occur for children um, in Texas at the, at the very least. This graphic is a, a point estimate which illustrates um, how uh, the proportion of uh, how each state, um, uh, how much of each uh, state uh, predicts a particular topic. So in this case, California um, comprises about seven and a half percent of this particular topic. Um, New York, Minnesota, Utah, and Connecticut round out the top five. And so, Given that this is the first, you know, 
indicative uh, or similar to the first round of coding, what we can take from this graphic is, well, in those five states, we might be um, really curious about why they, uh, at least it seems like those states have more regulations, uh, more laws on the books, more policies, uh, rules about uh, placement of a child um, than some of these other states. This graphic illustrates that California and New York, uh, as I mentioned, contribute the greatest proportion of topics to this topic. And so this kind of tracks with what we know about child welfare within these states, right? The population size, the expansiveness of the social safety net within these states, the policy apparatus. And so part of the work that we're doing now is ensuring that these uh, proportions are weighted to account for the regulatory size uh, in general for these states. So for example, it could be that you know, these states are the highest because they account for more documents overall. Uh, but that in itself might be an interesting question. You know, why do some states have more regulations than others? Uh, and so part of the answer we suspect is gonna come from the next phase of qualitative coding. Here's topic 32, um, which uh, we define as cultural competency. And so what we find here is, um, uh, here's some sample excerpts from uh, Connecticut and uh, Wisconsin. Uh, um, so being sensitive to diversity by reflecting awareness of race, culture, religion, and language, um, specific, much more specific language in uh, Wisconsin, uh, making sure that a placement or a, a foster home does not discriminate against the child because of um, race, cultural identification, uh, and so on. Um, but this last portion of the excerpt is particularly telling given what we know about child welfare and in particular um, Native American uh, child welfare in Wisconsin, you know, promotes cultural understanding and sensitivity in the child and respect for their culture. And so here's the point estimate um, for this uh, particular topic. And so what we find is that Georgia, Idaho, Montana, Hawaii, and Michigan uh, round out the top five here. So again, uh, to interpret this graphic, what we would take from it is that the, those five states um, contribute uh, the most documents to this particular topic. Topic 39 refers to review of complaints and child fatalities and um, certainly predictive analytics. The inception of predictive analytics uh, in child welfare arguably began as a, as a mechanism to uh, try to address child fatalities within child welfare. And so uh, the sample here is an excerpt from Washington, um, which uh, details um, what uh, whether a um, what kinds of questions or not um, can be asked of an employee who's responsible for conducting a child fatality or near fatality review. And the point estimate for this particular topic um, indicates that uh, Delaware, Ohio, Kentucky, uh, Maine, and Puerto Rico um, round out the top five. Topic 49. Um, is particularly interesting, at least to me, defining terms in child welfare regulations. And so here are two very telling sample excerpts. So in Kansas, a person means any individual, association, partnership, corporation, government, government subdivision, or other entity. In other words, a person could be just about anybody. As opposed to Maryland, where a private entity very specifically means a non-governmental organization, or excuse me, uh, agency, organization, or employer. And we find that for topic 49, uh, Michigan, Nevada, Arkansas, Kentucky, and New Hampshire round out the top five. And the last topic that um, I'll share about right now is uh, guardianship um, and, ad and or advocate appointment. And so um, here we have a sample from Indiana. Um, which uh, stipulates that a guardian ad litem or a court appointed special advocate doesn't have to be an attorney, um, but the attorney representing the child might be uh, appointed to the child's guardian ad litem. Uh, and so this relationship between uh, guardianship and advocates for children in care um, uh, is particularly interesting. And what we find is that uh, Maine, Kentucky, Washington State, South Dakota, and Wyoming round out the top five here. 
And so what I've shown you is uh, the process, and what I've talked about is um, the process we undertook to gather all of this data, uh, how it was almost impossible to actually gather, um, uh, but we did it, we persevered. Um, and what I've illustrated is how we use stru structural topic modeling to um, sort of get a first, uh, first round superficial uh, code uh, or uh, superficial thematic understanding, topical understanding of uh, all of the uh, documents that we've acquired. And so now we'll be, we've begun the process of diving qualitatively into the state of New York um, and developing this preliminary code book where we're looking to very specifically map out key terms and regulations, uh, processes of investigation, criteria for home removal, and very um, importantly, funding allocations, including sources and destinations. And so um, you might wonder why we're doing all of this. And it's because we wanna develop an index of causal variables. And so within the field of natural language processing or NLP, there's quite a bit of uh, developing work on using text for causal inference. And uh, our goal here is to very uh, methodically build uh, an index that we can use uh, to um, actually illustrate the relationship between the written policy as, as it is written on the books and the outcomes that we see in the national uh, child welfare data. And an important question that's been emerging as we've been looking, uh, sort of sifting through all of these policies is what's the relationship between child welfare rules and corporate interests? And um, uh, you might think back to uh, the, the topic on defining terms where in one state, uh, a person could mean anything um, versus um, very specifically a, a kind of entity. Um, but there's some uh, other things we've noticed. So for example, in Oregon, there are very specific numerous regulations about outdoor activities for youth and group settings. Um, it happens that uh, the Nike, uh, Nike is headquartered in Oregon uh, that might just be a coincidence. Um, in Virginia, there's a, quite a numerous amount of regulations concerning toilets uh, in youth facilities. And um, a really inordinate amount, actually. <laughs> um, it was really surprising. Um, it happens that uh, ProFlow, uh, also known as Ferguson, uh, which is a, does about $18.4 billion in sales, uh, in toilet sales in the United States, is uh, located in Fairfax, Virginia. Again, um, some interesting items that we've uh, come across as we've gathered this data and begun this work. Um, and so in summary, what I wanna share is sort of where we are as a team um, in our process of thinking about the relationship between policy and uh, child welfare outcomes. And that is that you know, the oppressor's tools won't dismantle their house, but they will show you how they built it. And it might be that reconstructing the child welfare blueprint uh, might help us identify what, if anything, is worth salvaging uh, during the renovation process. The other thing that's become abundantly clear, uh, COVID-19 global pandemic notwithstanding, is that this kind of deep work takes time. Again, uh, the process of gathering the data took nearly a year. Um, the process of going through the data, sifting through the data, the structural topic model was the quickest thing to happen <laughs> um, out of this whole thing. Um, it took a lot of time and it will continue to take time, but it is worth taking time um, so that our future can look very different than our past. Um, and I just want you to make sure you read that last one again. Deep transformative work takes time, whether it's quantitative or qualitative. Uh, the process of change takes time. And so with that, I'll end. And thank you very much for your attention and your indulgence. Maria, thank you so much for that fabulous talk. Every time I um, watch you, I learn so much. And so I'm just so appreciative of your time. You know, what I really uh, admire about your work and how you do your work is that you, you lead with this deep historical contextual um, framing that brings us into the historical problematic nature of the child welfare system uh, that I think oftentimes we um, overlook or don't 
dive into deeply. Um, and we're also in this moment of a national conversation about the abolishment of the child welfare system. So your work ties in nicely there. And of course, you know, I love the qualitative and computational combination. You are a person after my own heart. Um, so I'm so grateful <laughs> for that work as well. So when I, when I start off with some questions for you, uh, we have one from Dean Beck, uh, and the question is, great talk, Dr. Rodriguez. I'm struck by the fascinating paradox in your work. I'm a big proponent of using data for social justice. At the same time, we know that the most important things cannot be measured, as you have noted. How do you reconcile these issues in your mind, and do you see any dangers or risks in the type of work you're pursuing? Yeah, thank you. This is a great question. Um, so I think that um, I don't know that they can be reconciled, um, but they can be actively worked with. Um, I think that um, what I've seen in specifically child welfare, um, but even in other areas, you know, down to social media and so on, is that uh, the immeasurable is, uh, you know, I, I liken it to, you know, dark matter, you know, like, you know, <laughs> dark, like the immeasurable is what drives us. And, you know, dark matter is what propels the universe uh, and, and universal expansion, right? And so I think what, what's been key for me is um, working with, with like-minded people, you know, like uh, uh, Dr. Patton, um, uh, like Dr. Cogborn, who are, you um, firmly rooted in the culture in the in the in the people context of of the work and understand that everything that has not been said remains in the room right and so the the way to be able to speak what's not in the room is to get more people who are able to tap into that unspoken language um i hope i'm being clear um yeah yeah, I appreciate that. And it's, it's a question that we're constantly having uh, to toggle with because we have now these really sophisticated, innovative tools that allow for us to answer these, these most pressing social questions in ways that we haven't before, but they also invoke all of these new critical challenges that we need to think through as well. And it, and, it, and it leads me to a question around something that you said that I thought was really interesting is around this idea of codifying the path codifying the past into the future, right? And so one of the things I wanted to hear more about from you was that like, how do we ask better questions of our data? Because what, what I'm interpreting from you is that what we put in is extremely important. How we think about and process that information is really important, but it also starts with the question, right? So what are the ways in which you and your lab are asking, you know, the ethical questions of the data so that we get the outcomes that we're hoping for? Absolutely, thank you for that question. Um, so I think the first thing we do is that we don't rely on the IRB. <laughs> what I mean by that is that um, it's been my experience that, um, and, I, and I think other colleagues share this, that the, what, what might be permissible for an IRB is way below the ethical threshold that we should actually be holding ourselves to. Um, and so I would argue that our, our, our um, you know, at least within my team, we hold ourselves to the kind of standard of if I saw my grandmother walking down the street and I told her about what I was doing, would she be okay? <laughs> right. And if the, and, and to me, I literally think that, that holding myself accountable to elders, to ancestors, is, is probably the most fundamental way to be able to be ethical, practically, and you know, pragmatically. I think concretely in terms of quantitative work, you know, um, we have thrown every method that we know of um, at our, our national youth data, which is, you know, the publicly available NDA, uh, N-D-A-C-A-N, gosh, data. <laughs> uh, how's that, Cornell? And the simplest models are almost always the most clearly interpretable and therefore the most ethical. 
they're the ones that show us, you know, whether or not, you know, uh, you know, uh, a variable is a fixed effect. How uh, how variables modify other variables. I think, I, and I was guilty of this too. I think, you know, people thought, oh, you know, random forest or a support vector machine, like, you know, party over here. When the reality is like it, it doesn't get us. All it does is allow us to churn more data. It doesn't get a get us actually closer to an answer to the question. <laughs> Right. So uh, I hope that this is a question. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, another uh, uh, question for you. Algorithms are increasingly being used in child welfare. And as you indicated, they are based on problematic assumptions. What are you seeing in the field? Are jurisdictions starting to move away from that? No. No. I think they might. Um, what I have seen is a cessation in public commentary around the usage of that, those method, methods. Um, I have seen some states, I think New York in particular, last I checked, um, there was actually uh, the mayor's office, I think it was the last administration, yeah, it was the last administration um, put out a report on um, uh, ethical uses of algorithms and all those, it, they literally detailed all the places that the city was um, uh, looking to use algorithms or was already employing them and what processes they were, they were hoping to put in place to be accountable to community. Whether or not those things are happening, I don't know, you know, as administrations change, priorities shift. So, you know, I don't know what the status of that is. Um, but at least in New York, I know that there, you know, there's there's been some real um, movement by policy folks to to be as transparent as possible in that um, environment. But certainly across other cities uh, that I know of and folks that are working at that intersection, I, I think they've just stopped talking about it. Okay, so now is my time for my Oprah question. <laughs> you know, we have to go there. So, you know, there's this national conversation about the abolishment of the child welfare system. Where do you sit in that conversation? And what is the role of the academy in that conversation, in particular, schools of social work? Absolutely. I love the Oprah question. Thank you so much. Um, so, one of the things I tell my students all the time is, you know, imagine you're on a walk. It's a beautiful day. You're walking by a riverbank. You happen to look in the water. The sun is shining, glistening off the water. And you happen to notice a baby floating down the river. Presumably, hopefully, uh, your reaction is, I have to go get that baby. I, the baby needs to come out. You get the baby. But it happens that as you continue to enjoy, to try to enjoy your stroll every minute on the minute, that is, it's predictable, right? It's predictable every minute on the minute, you see another baby floating down the river. Eventually, hopefully, the question is not, why is the baby in the water? Where's the baby coming from, <laughs> right? Not just why is the baby in the water, but the baby could not have gotten there by himself and not all of them every minute on the minute at regular intervals. That is, if I can predict with high fidelity who is walking into a system, how often they're going to be walking into a system, maybe I need to ask why. And to my way of thinking, there is no human service system in the United States that is independent or outside of its history. And the history of the United States is one in which we decided that the quickest economic plan was to grab a bunch of people and force them to work for nothing and to kill anybody who refused. That is not in separate from any system that we've developed to care for each other. We haven't had a process to try to reconcile that. Um, I always think about the German example, right? There's at the very least a public discussion without it, you know, I'm sure it has its problems, you know. Um, should we burn it all down and start over? Maybe. But I don't think that we can. In other words, somebody still has to go get the baby out of the river. 
but I think it's a both and. And I think the role of the academy is to facilitate um, the kind of risk taking that allows us to imagine what it would look like to burn it down or to reform it from within if we can actually do that. The work that, I'm pre that I presented here today is us trying to figure out, is there anything that we can save? <laughs> Yeah, that's that's such a pragmatic social work answer. I appreciate that because it's real, right? There's lots of complexities, and it it seems like the uh, the best questions of the day should be the ones that we are able to pursue in this space. And so I'm I'm grateful that you're presenting um, these very rigorous questions that can allow us to think about where we should sit in this space. I'm also wondering about the classroom, right? The educational experiences of MSWs, right? And so here at Columbia, we have an emerging tech um, minor. And, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts around how do we innovate the curricular experience given the new tools that we have and given the new conversations that we're having in child welfare? What, what do you hope to see in MSW curriculum in this space now? So my dream, um, that I've thought about quite a bit. I would like to see MSW programs be an extra year. And the reason for that is because I would like to see MSW students have a methodological, a, a specified methodological training. In other words, I think, you know, and, and you and I have talked about this, you know, Places like uh, you know, social media platforms, um, tech platforms, these people need social workers in them, desperately, frankly. <laughs> um, they need them yesterday. But the reality is that our students aren't trained. They don't have the skills to do this. And frankly, you know, I always, I, I think of social work students as students who, have ha students who have had their heart broken and have decided that nobody will ever have their heart broken in quite the same way again. And that heartbrokenness leads to social workers who are running out there to you know, save everybody without having saved themselves. And so they're bleeding all over people who didn't cut them, right? And so I think that the, 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 the self-reflection process that needs to occur for social workers to not just be informed about themselves, but to be informed about the methods that they need to be conversant in. I don't need social workers to know how to code. I just need them to be able to understand what they're looking at when they see it, right? Because when, a, when an engineer comes to them and says, hey, we're gonna introduce this new recommender onto you know, insert platform here, you need to be able to see you know, who, what is the recommender privileging, right? who is going to be most impacted by that particular recommender, not just in advertising, but in content. And is there something that is harmful about that particular product that's being you know, put out? Um, so I'd like to see MSW programs grow by a year somehow um, so that students can get that basic language training in coding. Again, not that I need you to walk out and know how to put together a whole program, but I need you to be able to see what you understand what you're looking at so that when tech companies hire you and they're giving you all these, you know, files and you have all this code running, it's not like the matrix <laughs> and you're, you know, you can actually make sense of what's happening and can point out, no, that is harmful. That's going to harm this population. The marginalized are here and I need you to fix it in this way so that we center their outcomes and that, and therefore make this platform holistic for everybody. I hope that answers the question. No, absolutely. And I think my sidebar question for you is, is that should that extra year lead to a doctorate? Like, you know, the DPT programs where, you know, the doctorate is the terminal degree for asking folks for three years, sh should they then be earn, uh, earn a doctorate? They, they need to earn something that makes it worth their while. And I mm -hmm. think a doctorate would be particularly interesting. You know, I've seen a lot of... Um, and I'll confess to not being completely familiar, but I, I do know, for example, there's uh, quite a few DSW programs. One of the things I'd like to see is, um, you know, a concretization of that particular program as one that would be the most potentially, I could see that as one of the most suitable pro, uh, doctorates 
um, within a, a social work context to be employed within a tech platform, right? DSWs are practicing doctors, mm-hmm. right? They're a shorter duration. They're methodologically focused. Um, they're practically focused. Um, I think those folks would make great candidates for tech platforms. Interesting. I love it. Uh, another question. Really appreciated the historical background and context. There has been so much harm. Are there particular things that ordinary folks can do to help move the system in the right direction? Understand that you're complicit in it. <laughs> right? Um, you, me, I, all of us, right? We've all agreed, whether we knew it or not. And so as we begin to disagree, right, now that we can see maybe a little bit clearer, and that's really all life is, is just kind of messing up and then <laughs> like, oh, I really I should have gone left there. Uh, <laughs> um you know, as, as I, at least I'll speak for myself, as I begin to see my own complicity, right, um, then, then I, I take much more accountability, much more responsibility for the words that come out of my mouth. Hi, baby. Um, you know, so for example, you know, um, the kind of words I use, um, the, the kind of privileging of knowledge, right, who knows? This is a really essential question. Who knows? Who who, do, who is an expert, right? Um, what kinds of knowing are, are, are central to changing the world? It can't possibly be just academic ones, right? That doesn't, that doesn't stand to reason, right? Um, so understanding how complicit you are, that you are not separate from any harms being committed, that you too are part of it, um, will help you, A, begin to transform it within yourself, but also B, give you the ability to be much more compassionate to people who maybe can't see their complicity, right? Regardless of degree. I think one of the, um, one of the most terrible things is only speaking to people you agree with. It's a real disservice to humanity and to yourself. Yeah, you truly outlined the work ahead, the reflexive work that is a part of our profession in the first place. So I really appreciate that. Um, just one last question for you. I mean, there aren't a lot of folks in our field that are like you. Your, your training, your background, your experiences, your interest in data science, your work with algorithmic systems. How did you get here? Like, what did you do in your PhD program uh, to learn these methods? Um, and what have you done along the way to continue to engage in this space? Uh, yeah, thank you. That's a real practical question. Um, <laughs> I think my personally, you know, um, I happen to be, you know, technically a late millennial. And so, you know, I remember floppies and rotary phones and I was there for the first, the first cell phone, Omnipoint, um, at least in New York City. <laughs> um, I was, you know, um, but yeah, I, I, I had the good fortune to go to a really strong high school. I went to Brooklyn Tech High School. Yeah, I'm born and raised in New York City. Um, I grew up on 136 between Broadway and Amsterdam. Um, and um, you know, my grandparents still live on 157th, so I am um, what they call a, a statistical rarity. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I had the good fortune to go there and I got exposed to a lot of kind of tech early on. And um, in my doctoral program, um, I had the good fortune to go to University of Washington, Seattle, where, you know, Microsoft, everything tech is was there, certainly when I was um going and so I, I I became interested in data science out of complete laziness. I just didn't feel like reading 600 and some odd hearings, um, which is what I was gonna do for my qualifying exam. And so um, I, I started learning autom- it was called automated content analysis back then. I was just just before data science became a thing. And um, you know, just had the good fortune to be willing to fail. I think that there's a lot of fear of math in social services, kind of generally, but social work in particular. I think that um, I didn't let that deter me. I I was fine to fail a class or two, or you know, what I didn't fail any in my PhD program, thank God. But um, you know, I, I I'm willing to make mistakes, and I was willing to kind of sit and 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 spend the time. Um, and I've continued in this space because I've, I'm, you know, when I when I went to get my doctorate, 
Um, my community friend said to me, you know, well, who's that going to help? Who's a PhD going to help? You're not going to help anybody. You're going to sit in an office somewhere. People are still going to be, you know, starving and hungry and dying. And I said, well, I can at least hold the door open and I can at least go into rooms where somebody who looks like me and has, you know, comes from where I come from, hasn't been. So they made me a t-shirt that says the analyzer, distill and convey. And I still have that. Um, because that's my job. My job is to be of service. And, and it's my service that drives me. It's, it's, you know, the methods are fun. I, you know, my bar is, is it a good time? Yeah, well, then let's do it. <laughs> right? Um, but is it of service? You know, who can, can, I, can, I, can I amplify an aspect of the lived experience that has hitherto been oppressed or repressed um, or forgotten or neglected? Maria, thank you so much. I've learned so much. Um, this has been such a great time. So thank you so much for your 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 time and everything that you've offered for us. We have a lot to chew on um, as well. Uh, I'm going to turn you. it back over to Dean Begg. Thank you so much. What a phenomenal presentation. And and I'm just going to say, just um, the way I'm hearing it and seeing it, it's sort of this unexpected marriage of method and purpose. Uh, so, so thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for sharing your work with us. And thank you, Dr. Patton, for moderating beautifully, as always. And I'll, I'll just say, I'm, there's so many phrases that, that you brought up during this conversation that I, and I'm sure others, will remember for a long time after this. Uh, things like, you know, removing poverty from our sight, um, uh, children stripped of their identity, uh, remember that you are complicit, uh, and everything not said stays in the room. Um, it's just really powerful. So uh, just we're really grateful for your provocative comments and for your commitment, I hope it's okay that I say this, to stirring up good trouble. Uh, I think this is a great, great example of that. Uh, so thank you. And thanks to everybody for joining us. Thank you all so much. Take care.